ready. And I'm just going to ask my panellists um, in the order on the slide to uh, unmute themselves briefly and introduce themselves. Thanks, Jamelia. I'm Lizzie Crowley, and I lead CIPD's policy research work around or all around the skills agenda. And I'm Lucy Vores, and I'll be talking about the Steps Ahead Mentoring Programme and how it's a fantastic opportunity to help young people during the pandemic and how you can get involved. Thank you. And I'm Jane Galvez. Um, I'm an HR consultant at Ripple HR. And um, I am a Steps Ahead mentor as well. Um, so I support those young that. And I'm also an enterprise advisor. So I'll be talking to you about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Okay, so um, a few housekeeping things before uh, we get started, just to make sure everyone's kind of connected okay and can hear. Um, so uh, a couple of things, so to make sure you're connected to the audio so you can hear us and, and, um, and participate, if you select call using computer on the audio connection and then connect audio, then you should be able to um, hear and see everything as it runs. Um, and we do have um, a colleague, uh, Ali Platt, who is our um, host for today's webinar, um, and she will be um, available to answer any tech questions or if you're having any issues as, as we go through through the, the webinar this afternoon. Um, as I said, the webinar will be recorded, um, just so you know, so um, just so you're aware of that. Um, and then if you want to submit questions and things, so you'll see, I think you can see on the slide there, there's a little chat icon. Um, so if you click that icon, that's where you can submit um, any questions or if you're having any issues. Um, and if you message, um, if you tech issues, if you message uh, Steps Ahead Mentoring host directly, um, which is Ali, um, our host for, for this afternoon. Um, and just to encourage everybody um, to do submit questions and things as we go. Um, we will be trying to allow sort of 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to go through some of your questions. Um, but don't feel that you have to wait until then to, to ask your questions. But we will be using the chat window. We won't be using the Q&A window. So please don't submit your, your questions into the Q&A section. Please submit your questions into the chat section. And if you want everybody um, to encourage some discussion, um, please select all participants, all attendees in the drop down list. And that way, all of us as panelists will see uh, your questions as well as everyone who's attending um, this afternoon. If you want to send a private message to the host or to um, some of the presenters, then you can you can select those two. Um, but in terms of the general discussion, please use the, the chat window. Okay, so just to give you a bit of a summary of what we're going to be covering today. So um, first of all, we'll be hearing from Lizzie around youth employment and how um, how to protect young people from unemployment, which is a big challenge um, currently, especially with the unemployment figures going up and all the and the resources that are available. Um, I'll be talking a bit later about how our social impact and innovation team and what we're doing to try and support more young people into work and improve their um, career prospects. And more specifically, um, we will hear from um, on our we will hear about our Steps Ahead mentoring program. And I'm pleased that we've got Lucy here who will be talking about her experiences as Steps Ahead mentor and ambassador. And then we also have Jane here. I'll uh, be talking about our enterprise advisor program. Um, and Jane will be talking about her experiences through that. So hopefully give you a really good um, rounded view of the way you can get involved and really help um, use your skills to come attack some of these issues. And as I said, we'll allow about 10 to 15 minutes at the end um, to hopefully answer some of your um, some of your questions. Okay, so um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Lizzie, uh, who is going to talk through um, around more about youth youth employment. And I'll just hand over my presenting. Great. Okay, so now I've got control of the slide deck. Thank you, Jamila, <laughs> um, and welcome everyone. So, as 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 Jamila introduced, I'm going to talk a bit a bit today about the current labour market context, what the future might hold with regards sort of unemployment output growth in the UK. The impact on the youth labour market and the consequences um, of youth unemployment, how the government has responded so far and provide you some details of, of the schemes and, and the various things that we, that, we, that, we, that we know so far about them. And, you know, end with a bit about, you know, what the HR profession can do and our view at the CIPD on the effectiveness of these measures. So, um, right. 
Um, the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to be significant. The OECD has recently predicted that the UK could be amongst the worst affected economies, forecasting a fall of 11.5% in national income over the course of 2020. This is significantly worse than, the, than that of the EU or the OECD average, and it also outstrips the declines and predicted for Spain, France, Italy, Germany, the USA and Canada, as shown in this chart. As a result of the economic downturn, unemployment is predicted to rise sharply. And the OECD have forecasted that the unemployment could, after initial peak, reach around 7.8% by 2021. This is double the pre-pandemic figure. Also, the kind of the, the projections on this slide um, only show sort of a single hit scenario. If we do have a second wave, the OECD have predicted that actually one in 10 economically inactive active people could be unemployed by 2021 if we have to reintroduce restrictions. Young people um, are likely to be particularly hard hit by the economic downturn and actually figures suggest that they bore the brunt of the initial economic fallout from the pandemic. So according to research by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, young people were more, more than um, two, two, two and a half times more likely to work in sectors that were shut down compared to other employees. And this unequal impact is further backed up by research conducted by the University of Cambridge, which found that younger workers were more likely to have worked fewer hours and earned less as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic compared to other age groups. And early indicators suggest that it's already feeding through into higher rates of youth unemployment and higher numbers of young people on universal credit or job seekers allowance. The number of 18 to 24 year olds claiming work related benefits has more than doubled in the UK over the last four months. And there are now around you know, 540,000 young people claiming work related benefits. This is an increase of 122% since March 2020. As well as bearing the sort of brunt um, of the in the short term, young people are also likely to be disproportionately affected in the longer term as the full economic impact of the crisis hits the labor market. So recent research by the Resolution Foundation has estimated the potential employment and wage scarring that young people might face as a result of the economic crisis. Modeling the effect of a high unemployment rate on education's levers employment outcomes, they found that the employment rate of today's graduates are projected to be 13% lower three years down the line than they would have been in the absence of the crisis. And employment rates for mid-level and lower skilled workers are projected to fall even further. Added to this is the fact that actually um, many non-graduate education labourers start their careers in sectors that are likely to suffer declines in employment over the medium to longer term. So, for example, retail and hospitality. As discussed, a period of unemployment when young can have profound negative impacts on future earnings and employment potential, but it has also been shown to have a much wider reaching and persistent negative impact. So, for example, um, evidence from the 1981 recession shows that the impact of youth unemployment is still seen two decades on, with those who've experienced a spell of youth unemployment when young, recording poorer physical and mental health and decreased life and job satisfaction two days after, uh, two, de two, two decades after, sorry, um, compared to those who had not. So, in recognition of the likely rises in youth unemployment and its damaging long-term consequences, the government, on the 8th of July 2020, announced a series of measures to support access to education and employment and training opportunities for young people. The measures, which are part of a broader package for support set out in a plan for Jobs 2020, included um, the Kickstart Scheme, which was £2 billion of funding to create hundreds of thousands of new, new fully subsidised jobs for young people aged 16 to 20, 24 on universal credit and who are at risk of long-term unemployment. 
The funding covers um, a six-month job placement at 100% of the national minimum wage for the minimum of 25 hours a week, with employer, employers able to top up wages. In addition to this, employers will be given £1,500 per placement to support setup costs that could include you know, support and training for the young person. A further 11, 111 million to triple the number of traineeships, and employers will be given a £1,000 bonus for each traineeship learner they take on, up to a maximum of 10 per company. And as an apprenticeship incentives. So, for employers over the next six months who hire a young apprentice will receive a payment of £2,000, or if they recruit someone who is over the age of 25 to an apprenticeship, they will receive £1,500. It should be noted that these are actually on top of existing incentives. So, I mean, the ones that exist currently are a £1,000 payment to take on a 16 to 18 year old or that rises up to the age of 25 if that young person is on a health and care plan. So what do we know so far about um, the details that have been emerging about all these three um, schemes and how, how you can get involved as an employer? Okay, so first off, apprenticeship incentives. They are available from the 1st of August 2020 up until the 31st of January 2021. So if you want to, if you are hiring a new apprentice um, to your organization within that period, um, you can claim this incentive through your apprenticeship service account after you've added them to it. In terms of when you received it, um, the payments are split, so you will get half of the incentive payment at 90 days, and you'll get the remaining 50% after that apprentice has been with you for, for a year. And you can spend your, co your funding on anything to support your organization's costs. So you can find out more about applying for an apprenticeship incentive by going to the following the link on this slide. And the slide will be available um, after this presentation, after we've completed this webinar. On traineeship, so there's actually relatively limited awareness amongst employees about employers about traineeships, despite the program being around since around 2013, and was released uh, was introduced as a recessionary response measure to to um, reduce youth unemployment during the last economic downturn. So these tra traineeships are essentially a skills development program that includes a work placement. And the aim is to get a young person ready to take on an apprenticeship or an employment opportunity. So they last typically between, they can last between six weeks to, to a year, so they're flexible to an individual's requirements, but um, in general they last about six months. So trainees are not paid for the work that they do, but many employers do cover um, travel and other expenses. However, you do need to guarantee an, a job interview or for, for an apprenticeship or a job at the end of the placement, or if a job's not available, um, provide an exit interview with written feedback. In terms of the types of young people who are eligible for these um, traineeships, um, previously they were only available to those who are under 24 who are qualified at level uh, below level three, so you know, sort of that's a GCSE level and below. However, the government has now expanded eligibility, so it's actually available to those with A level equivalent, A level or equivalent qualifications. Evidence on the whole suggests that these are actually really quite successful in supporting young people um, access work or further learning, with around three quarters of people who engage in the scheme um, having a positive destination after 12 months. So we're still waiting um, to hear how employers can actually claim the incentive payment. Uh, so, but you can find out more about traineeships and keep an eye on that guidance by following the link. You can also talk to your apprenticeship provider if you've got one about how you can engage with these schemes. Okay, so on Kickstart, um, so there's been some re recent information released to provide more detail about how the scheme will actually work in practice. Although we don't, it's, it's not all there yet, but I've tried to summarize what we do now on this slide here. So in terms of the placement requirements, they, you know, they need to be new jobs. They must not replace existing or planned vacancies or cause employees or contractors to lose their job. 
The roles must be a minimum of 25 hours per week for six months, paid at least the national minimum wage for their age group, which is the part that's covered by government. And they should, the jobs themselves should not require sort of end, the people to undertake extensive training pre-placement. When applying for your funding, your application needs to include how, part how you're going to help participants develop their skills and experience. And this includes how you're going to be able to support job search, um, including careers advice and, and setting goals, how you're going to support with CV and in, in, interview preparations, and also how you're going to support that young person develop basic skills such as attendance, timekeeping, and teamwork, for instance. And if you want to participate in the scheme, you can now apply via the gov.uk website. The link is on this slide. However, it's really important to note that actually at the moment, they're saying that you can, can only engage in the scheme if you're able to offer a minimum of 30 placements. However, for employees, employers who aren't able to off, offer sort of 30 placements, you can and still engage in the program, but you're going to be able to, you're going to have to go through an intermediary. And again, you can find out how, which potential intermediaries are, are offering this service in your area by contacting your local or national Kickstart employer contact, contact for help getting a representative. Those details are also available um, if you click on that, that link that's, that's in this slide. So, how effective are these measures likely to be in tackling what looks like it's going to be quite a dramatic rise in, in the level of youth unemployment in the UK? So they're only going to be effective if they lead employers to create additional jobs, apprenticeships, or work placement opportunities for young people over and above what they plan to do in the absence of these measures. And on Kickstart, evidence from a similar scheme introduced to tackle youth unemployment in the last recession shows that effective employer engagement is absolutely critical to their success. Previous schemes have struggled in the past because employer take-up was low or limited to low-paid opportunities in the public or charitable sector. So this scheme may, may face similar difficulties if it doesn't effectively engage with the private sector, uh, especially at a local level. And there also needs to be really strong support to help young people prepare for what happens after the scheme is finished. And although um, you know, the, uh, the application process suggests that um, employers are going to have to provide some of that, there's going to be a critical role for other organizations, and particularly for work coaches um, in the job center, to ensure that a young person is really ready to transition to, to something else in the placement end, because it's not as guaranteed of a full-time job after the six months are up. Uh, and we know that actually if these schemes are going to be effective, the government needs to place much stronger emphasis on actually skills development and training and investment in lifelong learning if we're actually going to reskill and upskill um, you know, the, the, the workforce to ensure when we go through this period of change. We've recently released some search which looked at the short-term and long-term measures needed to strengthen the apprenticeship pathway for young people. And while the new incentives are, are, you know, are welcome, um, the lack of targeting, for example, on smaller employers who are less likely to take on apprentices means that the programme risks considerable dead rate, that is providing funding for apprenticeships that would have happened in the absence of the scheme. And evidence from the last recession suggests that they might have been actually better to have larger, much more generous incentives targeted at SMEs who are less likely to engage with apprenticeships. However, all in all, um, you know, the HR community will be absolutely critical to the success of these measures and ensuring that they work not just for the young people involved, but also importantly and crucially for the business. And this means understanding how they fit into workforce planning strategies and address um, recruitment and skills challenges, as well as ensuring that supportive workforce practices such as mentoring and line management are in place so that the young person and the business gets the most out of the work placement, traineeship or apprenticeship. Yet even if you aren't able to engage in these schemes, there are other ways the profession can support young people during this challenging time and help them navigate the increasingly complex world of work and find jobs and fulfilling careers. And today you're going to hear about some of the way, other ways that you can support young people. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Libby. Uh, I'm just going to take control of the presentation.
Thank you. Great. So thanks, Lizzie. As you, um, so as Lizzie's talked about, there's obviously some some big challenges ahead, but um, but some you know, obviously there is some support there. But I'm going to talk a bit more now about um, about what uh, the CIPD and um, specifically in terms of our social impact um, and innovation team are doing to to provide more support to young people in terms of helping them get into work uh, and and hopefully um, succeed in terms of their careers. Um, but firstly, um, a little bit more about um, about our team and what we what we do and what we're really here for. And um, so, as many of you know, we're you know we're part of the CIPD, and the CIPD's purpose is really about championing better work and working lives, and making sure that work can and should be a force for good, and that's for all for everybody. Um, you know, whatever your your situation or your or your background. Um, and really what our team does is about taking that and taking it into action. So we deliver a range of programmes, policy driven programmes um, that um, deliver on the CFD's purpose, but by mobilising and equipping our members and the people and people professionals, so not everything that and all our programmes are, are member only, um, to drive positive change of the world of work through practical action and more specifically through um, through volunteering. And the fantastic thing is, is that currently through our social impact programmes, we have over 3,000 um, volunteers and that number continues to grow. So um, so year on year compared to, um, to this last financial year from um, July to June compared to the, the previous year, um, 2018 to 2019, we've, we had sort of 10, 10 to 12% um, increase in terms of volunteers signing up our programmes and we Got some new programs that, that we've developed as a result, as a result of COVID. So there, there really is interest there, and, and I think for me, um, you know, my background being volunteering sector, it's really amazing to see the engagement and the enthusiasm that I see from the sort of people profession and our, and our members in terms of wanting to make a change and wanting to be um, be a positive force um, for good and help, helping people. So. Um, on the right, you can see um, a number of uh, logos and also some uh, some of our, our programmes and some of our key partners. Um, and I guess a few that I will call out specifically in terms of the programmes that we're talking about today. Um, it's a careers and enterprise company um, who we work with around the Enterprise Advisor programme, and we'll talk a bit more about that a bit later. Um, and Team London as well, who we work with on Enterprise Advisors and also our Skill Up programme, which is about providing support to charities. Um, and our September mentoring, uh, where one of our primary uh, partners is Job Centre Plus, although we do work with other organisations as well to, to reach, reach the audiences we're trying to support. Um, and you see there's a few um, programmes mentioned there. So um, a couple of new programmes that we uh, we developed through COVID is around support, um, mentoring support for charities and supporting SMEs um, and providing support to them through COVID. So if you want to understand anything else about some of the other programmes that we do, um, feel free to drop a note in the chat. Um, or we'll offer contact details um, in our follow-up so that if you do have questions or are interested in some of the other programmes that we're not talking about today, um, then you can certainly um, find out find out more. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about our um, September mentoring programme. Now, this is a, it's one of our longest-running um, social impact programmes and was initially set up um, shortly after the financial crash um, when youth unemployment at that time, as many of you I'm sure will know, was very, very high. Um, and this is a free um, national employability programme. And when I say national, it's available it's currently available across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, we are trying to um, get it going in Northern Ireland as well. So, um, so watch this, this, this space on that one. But really what it offers is um, it's a member only programme. So it's because um, it's CIPD run. So, um, what we do is recruit CFD members to be head mentors to provide short-term mentoring support to job seekers with a focus um, primarily since it began um, and uh, the focus currently will be on 18 to 24 year olds. Although we have um, provided support through the programme to parents um, who are looking to return to work after a period of work, looking after children or with caring responsibilities um, and to carers as well, although not on the same scale as we have for young people. Um, we have supported over 6,000 people through the programme since it began, and that continues to increase. Um, and I guess the traditional model of it, which has been, has been running for the last few, last few years, is uh, it's, it's the short-term mentoring we provide around six meetups, really focused on employability support, so things like um, CV skills, building confidence, interview practice, um, and that's over, over a period 
historically around 12 weeks, but we, during COVID, we have increased that to around 22 weeks to allow, we understand that a lot of people are under different pressures, so we to try and have a bit more of that flexibility. And initially, face-to-face -face support was offered, but currently, um, support, all the mentoring support has been, has been delivered remotely um, to see to um, comply with um, the guidelines at the moment. Um, but we've been through um, some change. You know, we're looking at we're looking at all our programmes and making sure that they're fit for purpose in terms of the COVID world or post-pandemic world. Well, when, whenever that post-pandemic happens, um, that we're living in. And as Lizzie talked about, the youth um, employment is and, and unemployment is a is, you know a big challenge. It's already rising quite significantly. Um, and we really wanted to, you know, all the knowledge that we've built over the years in terms of the programme and, and the kind of support. And we really, and we're talking to our mentors and ambassadors that. You know what, what does the program need to look like to really fit with this kind of new world um, so we're looking at relaunching the program uh, later in October to the time of National Mentoring Day and, <clears throat> and we'll be offering with a focus on providing mentoring support to young people to young people coming out of education and um, who need that that mentoring support to help them help them get closer to, to finding work we have two offers so we have Steps Head Express where and um, this will be offering sort of one to two hours support, and this will be more specific. So for those perhaps they've got an interview coming up and they just want to do a bit of interview practice with um, with one of our mentors, um, or folks on specific employment issues, but very kind of short term. We know that's that's happened a bit with the program in the past. Um, and then Steps Head Plus, which is the longer longer term, more intensive mentoring support, so over a longer period, over about five months, providing a minimum of six sessions, but it can be more. Um, and this is this is sort of adapted from um, from the traditional offer, um, and this is really about doing that bigger piece around supporting um, in terms of you know some some of the young people coming to us may not even have a CV yet, so helping them kind of work through that and pull that together. Think about application forms. Think about it, get much better insight from our mentors as people professionals in terms of what employers are looking for and what they need to think about to, to help them on that path um, and help build and just build that understanding. Um, so they're the two main formats that will be will be coming up. Um, and then in terms of the outcomes from the programme, um, and this is where I, I will um, ask Lucy to, um, to potentially uh, contribute her findings from being from taking part in the programme. But really, what job seekers gain is employability skills. And I think for me, the thing that I sort of see is that it, it's really also about helping, um, particularly young people, see what they see what they have to offer and see what they can. You know that some of the things that they perhaps might not have thought about as 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 a skill or as something that's helped them gain skills and helping them articulate that better to potential employers and and really kind of put that on their CV or LinkedIn and articulate that well in, in interviews. And having them just feel much more better equipped in terms of job hunting, improve self confidence, and just a much better understanding of the current kind of world of work and what they need to think about to, to get that first that first job. Lucy, I don't know if you had anything else that you wanted to to add to that from your experiences. Yeah, sure. And I think one of the brilliant things about the programme is the flexibility. So you can really target your efforts where the job seeker really needs it. So they may need that short term help with just polishing their CV and getting that application in. Or as you say, they might want the longer term moral support um, and help if they're just finding their confidence has taken a dip during the pandemic and they've had several knockbacks. But I think it's also particularly relevant now when people may need different forms of help. So my most recent job seeker who I was helping, we met back in February when obviously had no idea what was about to hit us in terms of a pandemic. And she joked at the time saying, well, I'm happy to have our conversation by phone call. But I'd never ever have a video interview or a conversation with you because I'd be hopeless at that. It'll be terrible and hopefully I'll never need to have that. And then obviously, of course, pandemic strikes and all of her job applications resulted in video interviews, but a bit of trial and error um, practice and a few hilarious moments on the way. And actually, she became a, a bit of a master at video interviewing and got the job she wanted and even very cleverly managed to negotiate a pay rise uh, before she started by video interview too. So it's about being flexible and being able to use all of those different different tools to help young people with what they need right at the moment. Great. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and just in terms of the stats, I guess the kind of, you know, does the programme program work? So um, six in ten people who complete the programme do secure employment. So that's, you know, really, really positive. And that's, um, you know, that really sort of shows that, it, that the support that our um, mentors like Lucy are, are providing to, um, to these mentees really, really does make a difference. Um, and eighty percent of the of the mentors report back to us that it's actually been invaluable in helping them secure employment. So even if at the end of the mentoring they might not have a job, 
they will be feel they are much closer to, to getting there and hopefully it won't be too much long before they do. Um, and we've got a nice little quote there from one of our mentees, Alice, um, just about remembering going for her first interview and trying to sort of offer things for her mentor at all and trying to sort of remember that um, and actually resulted in, in getting the job, which is, which is amazing. Um, so um, I wanted to hear a bit more um, from Lucy in terms of in terms of um, Lucy's experiences as a sex ed mentor and ambassador. And I should say, well, I'll, I'll let Lucy talk a bit more about, about the ambassador role when you're um, going into a bit more detail. So over to you, Lucy. Thanks, Namila. Um, yeah, so I've been a mentor for the Steps Ahead programme for about three years now. And for a couple of years, I've also been a local ambassador for the programme. So this means that I can go out and visit local job centres to talk to the work coaches about what we do and how they can refer job seekers to the programme, as well as attain, attending the original kind of employers events or apprenticeship fairs as well. So I suspect like many of you out there, I've enjoyed lots of different sorts of volunteering roles throughout my working life. As always, it's great to know you're making a difference and it helps to see the world from a completely different perspective. So being able to help someone in this way, even in just a small way, just to find their place in the world of work is massively rewarding in itself. And I think, as I alluded to earlier, the Steps Ahead programme is really quite unique because uh, it, it combines a highly professional framework with a huge amount of flexibility. So I've always feel confident I've got access to the training and the information I need while I'm free to fire, focus my firepower where it's really needed. So, for example, whether somebody needs a bit of hands-on support, I can roll up my sleeves and help do their job application and CV with them. Or maybe they need some longer-term emotional support to build some self-confidence. Or perhaps they just need me to step back a bit and be a sounding board to them while they reflect on a new career path. And the programme is always flexible enough to allow me to do that and focus on their needs without having a really prescriptive checklist or set of restrictions I have to follow. So I just feel like as a volunteer, I can make every second of my time matter. So as well as feeling I'm making a difference through the programme, I have found a huge range of personal benefits as well from being a volunteer. So I think the first one is that it does help me use and refine the critical core skills that are really so important in today's business world. So just being able to listen to someone, I mean really listen to them, building a strong and trusting relationship, showing empathy, and being able to give good, honest feedback, all very important skills today as ever. I think second, being a volunteer really helps me feel part of the CIPD community rather than just being a member. So I've met lots of people through the Steps Ahead programme that I wouldn't normally have otherwise met with them. And being able to connect with other mentors, other like-minded volunteers, and people who have that same passion and commitment into helping people get into work in itself is really rewarding, I find. Finally, I think this is one volunteering opportunity where I can honestly say I've learned some completely new skills and pushed myself outside of my comfort zone. So, for example, when I first began mentoring, I was secretly really terrified that somebody was going to ask me to help them write a CV. I guess I wouldn't have what you call a traditional HR background, and I'd be much more comfortable stepping back and thinking through how a large organisation can plan its recruitment strategy at a higher level. But actually dealing with the nuts and bolts of writing a CV and working out what earth somebody has to, to write on it to be hired was quite new to me. But there's loads of resources on the CIPD portal for Steps Ahead. Um, and lots of information online, as I'm sure you can imagine. And so with a bit of trial and error and probably some dumb luck as well, CV writing is now one of the things that I actually feel most comfortable with and secretly I actually quite enjoy it. Although don't tell my friends and family, I've got a huge line of people wanting to rewrite their CVs for them as well still. So given all of that, and I was reflecting on it recently, I've been asked quite often by job seekers and work coaches why I'd want to give up my time to do this. And actually the answer is really simple because the access we have to top class training the professional support we have from the dedicated CIPD team, strong community of volunteers and countless opportunities to test and develop new skills that are at the heart of our profession, I guess why wouldn't I volunteer? And if you're interested, it's very, very easy to take part. There's links in the chat room at the moment and another link at the end of the presentation where you can access all of the information about the volunteering schemes. There's plenty of information there about what it involves, the time commitment and the training and everything else that you'll, you'll have available to you. And we've got some time for questions at the end, so if there's anything you'd like to ask, please do. And if you don't have time to stay for the question time, then please either connect with me through the CIPD team or find me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you and be happy to help with any questions you have. Thanks. Back to you, Jamila. Thank you for joining the, the webinar today. Um, I can see there's been some questions coming through, but I'll, I'll look at I'll, um, just some more of those towards the end. 
Um, okay, so the next program um, I'm going to talk about is our Enterprise Advisor program. Now, I should say this is not a CIPD uh, run program, it's a national program. Uh, and in this case, when I say national, I mean England only. Um, that uh, we support in partnership with the Careers and Enterprise Company, and we have done since around 2016. And this is really much more of a strategic. Uh, volunteering opportunity and it's about um, directly supporting a school, a school uh, generally working with the leadership team or the careers leader to develop and implement um, their careers offer for the students. Um, currently on the overall Enterprise Advisor Programme, which is my careers and enterprise company, we have, there's over 3,000 uh, enterprise advisors currently supporting around 3,600 schools. Um, and some of this is around trying to sort of, as well as home and career strategy as part of that, trying to increase the number um, of encounters with employers um, that students have, whether at school or whether in my places. Um, obviously, at the moment, uh, I think it tends to be a bit more virtual, but I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, in terms of the CIPD, we've recruited over 1,200 um, people, professionals, as enterprise advisors who, who are part of that cohort and supporting, supporting the programme and supporting schools across England. And uh, I think something that we're really proud of is, is, how, um, is how great our enterprise advisors are. And you'll hear more from Jane a bit later about, about her experiences, but just to mention that at the um, Careers and Enterprise Awards in 2019 and 2018, um, the Enterprise Advisor of the Year Award was to one of our CIPD um, recruited volunteers. Um, and last year, we also um, won an award uh, for our for the partnership of the year for our partnership between CIPD and Careers and Enterprise Company, which really is um, fantastic. Um, let's talk a bit more um, on the practical side. So really, um, the Enterprise Advisor role is um, voluntary and it's about connecting with schools. And there's lots of ways that you can um, you can really kind of use your skills and knowledge and your contacts to really help help the school. Um, in terms of developing their career support and connecting them with a lot more um, a lot more employers and creating more of those opportunities for the students to, to have those employer interactions which really do make, make a huge difference um, to their career prospects. Um, a different way of using your knowledge as people professionals to, um, to really help in a, in a different way, a different audience. And, and for us, and there's a lot of the challenges that, that Lizzie talked about um, earlier, it's really critical, um, you know, it's a step to head deal for people, you know, provide the support to young people when they've left education. But this is really trying to almost go further back than that. You know, the earlier we can start this support and this, um, you know, this support for young people and, and kind of prevent some of the, um, the high um, unemployment figures with this group, the better. And this is a really critical role in terms of bridging that gap between education and employment. Um, in terms of commitment, it's around eight hours a month, um, and generally you're connected to a school for about a year. And um, and this is an amazing stat: so 82% of schools have said that enterprise advisors have helped them to improve their careers plan and strategy, which is really really positive. Um, and just to talk briefly about um, some of the outcomes um, that we that have seen through the, through um, the enterprise advisor role and the impact of the people part of the volunteers that are participating in this. So. Um, the Education and Employers uh, Task Force did some research and found that um, for students, for young people who have four or more um, interactions with employers um, during their time in education, when they leave, they are 86% less likely to become needs. That's not an education, employment, or training. And they earn 18% more um, after employer encounters compared to those um, students who don't have any at all. So. It really matters. It really makes a huge difference. Um, you know, the role of the enterprise advisor and, and providing more of that opportunity for students to um, to get a better sense of what. Um, and as a result of um, the enterprise advisor role, eighty percent of, of young people have an increased awareness of different careers, and seventy-two percent feel feel more motivated. And, and Jane, I don't know if you wanted to briefly mentioned the kind of impacts that, that you've seen um, through through your time as an enterprise advisor. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's uh, It's been an interesting journey with my particular um, college because I'm linked with a college in Litchfield and um, some of the impacts that we have seen are um, think, very simplistic things which you probably wouldn't think of. But when I first started working with a college, um, I was speaking to a few leavers and they didn't know what LinkedIn was. 
um, they just never had it on the curriculum. So we made sure that that went into the curriculum and now the leavers have that opportunity to start building those relationships right from the start. When they have somebody come in to talk to them, they can ask to link in with them and then it just starts their relationships throughout their community of business professionals. Brilliant. Thank you, Jane. Um, and just to talk a bit um, very briefly about how, how the program and how the role is adapting um, during COVID. Um, <clears throat> obviously, traditionally, uh, enterprise advisors would go directly to the schools and meet with them, um, as well as having uh, an email and telephone conversations. But now everything is, is moving to being virtual. So um, virtual, uh, there's virtual contact with the careers leaders in the schools. Uh, virtual mentoring available for students and teachers and the enterprise coordinators in, in the different areas and um, their meetings all happen virtually now and, and actually like, obviously that has its, has its challenges but I think one of the things that needs is that sometimes those, those meets you can get more people um, who are able to able to attend because, because it is a virtual virtual space rather than physically needing to be, be somewhere um, more training is being um, developed for more online resources and guidance being produced um, and more volunteer training on kind of upskilling on key tools. So, um, so a lot of the schools use a, um, a schools tracker to track kind of good careers education and, and providing kind of more support in terms of understanding that. Um, and trying to make sure that the schools, because really this role is meant to be a strategic role, and um, so giving the, the schools and the enterprise the chance to really focus on that kind of big picture and more strategic strategic work. And um, so the program, you know, has uh, adapted really well and um, well during during COVID and. Hear a bit more about that from Jane in a moment. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, for our last sort of, uh, before we move into questions, we're going to hand over to, to Jane Gilbert, who is going to talk about um, her role as an enterprise advisor volunteer and also as an enterprise one of our enterprise advisor champions as well. So, I'll just hand over to you, Jane, for the five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about how important it is to um, become an enterprise advisor. For me, I was in a position where I was new to the area and I was looking to do some kind of volunteering, but I wasn't really sure what, it, what I wanted it to be. And then um, I was approached as a Steps Ahead mentor to be an enterprise advisor. And that fitted perfectly for me because what I learned, as Lucy alluded to, is that sometimes when you're trying to support the um, individuals on the Steps Ahead program, they don't necessarily have the employability skills. So to me, that was a case of let's take it a step backwards, look at what's going on, and maybe I can help in that kind of area uh, before I get people that don't have the skills um, to try and help them when it's a little bit too late. Um, because if you think about it, today's young people, that we need to support them because they'll be supporting us when we're older. And it just makes total sense to me from that point of view. Um, so as far as that's concerned, um, the link between careers and curriculums, which I saw was missing, was um, absolutely top of my priority list. And um, to see them leaving the college now with better employability skills is a massive bonus. The um, careers and enterprise company provide a lot of tools to help support all of their enterprise um, advisors. We have um, bi-monthly meetings where everybody gets into um, a room and shares experiences, and that's been invaluable understanding where other people are on their journeys with their particular schools or colleges. And definitely with the Litchfield um, campus of the college that I'm working with, we had to we had to strip it right back to basics, and having done that in several businesses, um, it was a case of mentoring the careers leader as well. So getting access to the senior leadership team and all of that, which is it's quite challenging. Things don't move fast, so if you want to be an enterprise advisor, that's probably one of the most important things that I can tell you. I'm very often asked to speak to other enterprise advisors um, because I will just be totally honest. Because the first year that we spent working together was really difficult. Um, we had a different SLP and the challenges were huge. So we luckily the, the SLT switched and um, the challenges became lesser as they were more open to 
to be, become accessible. So I definitely, definitely suggest getting involved in this program. If you're looking for a very worthwhile volunteering experience, the Enterprise Advisor is it. You can work strategically. That is your role. It's not really about rolling your sleeves up and getting involved. But having said that, I've been working with um, South Staffs College for three years now. I'm not prepared to give that up. I'm very happy to be asked every year, do you want to continue? Because we have had to do a lot of that. We've had to do a blend. But I've also seen people develop in their roles in that. And that's been very, very rewarding for me. Um, just to offer the difference by bringing people in to talk about their roles, um, people from the business community to talk to the students and the learners about what it is that they love about their business. And it's just a fantastic programme to be part of. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you. That was um, really helpful. You're welcome. Um, and it's, I would say it's always, always better to hear it right from the horse mouth in terms of just people actually directly volunteering on the programme. So we have about um, 10 to sort of 15 minutes or so for um, questions. And I think there's a couple of questions um, that have come up. Um, so just a couple of more practical ones, I guess, in terms of will the recording be available after the session and the slides? And if the answer is yes. And we will be making those available. And of course, we will share um, uh, contact details if you want to find out more about being an enterprise advisor and, and how you can do that, how you can sign up. And similarly, with, with Steps Ahead too. Um, and of course, we did sort of not really talk about some of the other programs. So if that is, if you know, if you want to know more about the broader and um, all our programs, then we can, can provide that. And I know Ali's been sharing um, some of the links that we've been, we've been talking about today. Um, so I think one of the, one of the questions are the programs UK wide. I think Scotland, I haven't heard of these programs previously. So the Enterprise Advisor program is England only. Um, so that so um, so it's not in Scotland. It's, it's it's England only for that one. Steps Ahead is available in Scotland and Wales as well as England. Um, although it's not, we have been working with job centres there, um, but it's it's not been as wide. It's not been on the same sort of scale as as that in, in England. And um, comparably, so that may be why, why you haven't necessarily heard these programs previously. But I think a big thing for a particular step ahead, where it's the CIPD run program, um, you know, part of the plans around the relaunch is really to kind of um, pick up that um, the programs across across UK nations, and that's, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, okay, let's check some of the questions. Um, Okay, it's a question that I am, <clears throat> I guess, to to um, to Jane and Lucy. I just wondered if you had any advice. Um, we've got quite a few people um, on the webinar today. I think we've got around 100. Um, but any advice for people who are thinking about volunteering, um, with those who are either in education or um, with the education sector, or those who are who are um, who are recent leaving the education or leaving education. Any any kind of other advice or tips that you'd want to want to share? I definitely say talk to somebody who's already in that role. And if anybody's considering an enterprise advisor role, I'm really happy for you to connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out uh, via the panel. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, do connect with us and then also have a look at the wealth of information that's online because there's plenty of case studies that give some really good detailed examples of exactly what the mentors in the Steps Ahead programme will be doing or the enterprise advisors as well. So you can see actually what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and if you have any concerns about whether there are some aspects of it that you would find difficult, like I admitted to finding CV writing impossible to start with, then don't worry because I think everybody's in that situation when they start and there are so many resources out there available to help you. So don't be put off by that. Just get in touch with someone and find out whether or not it's something you'd enjoy. Yeah, thank you, um, Jane and Lucy. And then we've had a question uh, in from one of our attendees. That is there a community for volunteers to speak to each other so that we can support appropriately and, and confirming the length, um, the length of commitment? Um, so one of the great ways to connect um, with other CIPG members who some who will be volunteering through these programmes and some may not be is through our CIPG branches network. That can be a great way to, to connect with other people. In terms of um, um, an online community, we don't necessarily have those for um, specifically for the programmes, but what we do try and do and we're trying to do more of is providing through the programme specifically providing more opportunities where um, 
mentors or where enterprise advisors can um, can sort of come together and, and have discussions and share feedback with, with us or, or connect with each other. Um, so, uh, so it's something we want want to improve as well, and getting more ways to connect. But the CIC branch could be a really great way to, to connect with other volunteers um, as well. And then in terms of length of commitment, so just to confirm on, on steps ahead, um, it kind of depends. Uh, uh, at the moment, the commitment is around sort of 12 weeks supporting a, a mentor, providing a minimum of six six meetups. So that's probably about sort of 12 to 15 hours over six months, at the, or over five months at the moment. Um, because we've extended it to 22 weeks. Um, but as when we launch the kind of express as well, there'll be opportunities for people to get involved in a much shorter term way as well. Um, and for the enterprise advisor role, it's about eight, approximately eight hours a month. Um, and generally, enterprise advisors are asked to commit um, for a year. Um, so just looking through some of the other questions we've got. Is this available only to senior level HR professionals from ISHA? I'm a HR assistant with a multi academy trust and currently studying the CMT level five diploma in HR management. So um so it's worth it's worth submitting an application and I and the um Olga and Charlotte from the Enterprise Advisor team. And I'm assuming you're talking specifically about enterprise advisors. Um because it, it will partly be about um level of experience, but it but there are other kind of factors in terms of in terms of the role that may mean that you you know you would you would qualify to be an enterprise advisor so what i would say is if you're really interested in taking part i think maybe like this was offered sort of jane can, um connecting um jane and the enterprise advisor team as well and um, to find out find out more and understand a bit more about that kind of recruitment process and what's and what the requirements are and we can we have sort of role profiles for all our volunteer roles um but you know, other experience counts. So, um, so I would definitely, if you're interested, I would definitely apply. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that, Jane. What would you, what would you say? I would. The um, the recruitment process is is um, twofold. First of all, you go through um, a conversation with one of the HR professionals from the CIPD. Then you also go through um, a conversation with somebody from the career and enterprise company. So uh, during that process, you will, you find out exactly what it is the role entails and um, you know what the expectations of you are. But of course, every setting is different. So um, I would say if you're really interested, give me you know reach out, um, connect with me on LinkedIn, and I'm really happy to have that conversation before you put your application in. Right. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Um, and then I should say the step heads. Uh, mentoring uh, mentor role is open at all levels all CIPD member levels so um that's that's sort of less um can be a less senior role um i think there's a question here which i might call on members of the enterprise advisor team who are who are on this call and um, so when i see holding meetings for the enterprise advisors ali i don't know if you want to yeah so <laughs> hi everyone i'm ali i'm your tech host um, <laughs> yes, in terms of meetings, it really is working with the school directly to set up your meetings. So it is eight hours per month, time commitment for one year. Now that eight hours will be remote for the remainder of the year. And with that, you'll work on your strategy with the school. In terms of wider meetings, um, that would be with the careers enterprise company, and that's another um, opportunity to meet with other EAs. And then there also are networking opportunities through Facebook workplace that they offer in order to connect with other EAs. Jane, would you find that that's your experience as well? Absolutely, and I think those are invaluable, um, especially the face-to-face. -face. I mean, I know we're not doing it at the moment, but um, we usually meet early for breakfast, so um, people can disappear to their normal day jobs by about 10 o'clock. And um, it's really valuable to share those experiences. And the Facebook um, site that we also have now is, is quite useful too. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, I've just got, uh, just, it's not, not a question, but it's just more nice to see. So Catherine has said, I'm an, I'm an enterprise advisor and I love it. What, what there is a source of is, um, is enterprise advisor support in SEND school. So actually that's uh, interesting because that's one of the things we are, um, Looking to try and offer that for that more, so trying to publicise that opportunity that you can um, can support um, special educational needs 
um, schools as well. Um, Ali, I don't know if you have wanted to add anything to that in terms of, in terms of getting more EAs match with those types, those types of Yeah, schools. so one of the main areas of recruitment we're focusing on is recruiting um, EAs who are interested specifically in working in a special needs or a provisional um, PRU school setting. And the program does have resources specifically for those schools. So you are supported just as much as you would be with working in a secondary school. And what a lot of people find by volunteering in those schools, it really helps them with their diversity and inclusion work at their employers because the world of work should be inclusive of everyone. And a great way to build programs that can help students is by meeting those students and working with those schools directly so they can have a smooth transition into the world of work. Brilliant. Thank you, Ali. Um, Jane, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that because you're, you're not working with a special educational needs. I'm not, but I have no. had a call with a lady who was considering that role and um, we went into it in quite a lot of depth. And um, we do have some STEM students at the college. So we focus probably 80% on mainstream and then 20% on send um, at the moment, just using the resources that we have available. Brilliant. Thank you, Jane. Um, I know we've got a few minutes left to have some more questions. So one that's coming from Sherilyn is, how does it take to get access to the set -to portal once completing the mentoring agreement? It's normally fairly quick. Um, I think the main thing is that it's a cross-check um, to make sure that because um, we do a cross check to check people signing up for members and also that they complete the mentoring agreement and normally it's quite quick. Lucy, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about how quick the sort of sign up process is uh, for, coming, for becoming a mentor. I know you've been a mentor for a while, so. Yeah, it's a long time ago, but I remember it was super quick. You know, we're talking about days, um, not weeks, months. Um, and then there's all the training set out available so you can see when the next webinars are. And then there's no pressure to take your first mentee until you feel ready to do it. So once all the checks are done and in place, you have easy access to everything. You can pick and choose what training you need and then get started. So, yeah, it's very straightforward. Brilliant. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so a couple more questions. A couple more questions. Though, I think I can answer everything um, in the chat, and then I've got a couple of questions for our panel. Um, so Laura, I know you have to leave, but yes, you're right. The slides will be shared. Um, and also, notice in the chat, Liz um, from the Lancashire branch, I think, um, has uh, kindly agreed to be sharing the links from webinar with her with her branch and um, volunteers. So that's that's brilliant. Her branch network. So. Um, really appreciate that, and um, you know it's great to be able to get the word out there more, and I think get more people involved in these opportunities. Um, so I just have a couple more questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat just to make sure there's not any that I'm missing. Um, a quick question for Lizzie. Um, just when you were talking earlier around the Kickstart program, and also the um, numbers of um, uh, they have to get on board. I just wondered if you had any uh, information on ways that SMEs could potentially get involved and access the Kickstart program. Um. Yes, yeah. So there are um, contacts available um, on gov.uk for um, smaller organisations who can't offer the min minimum 30 placements. So you can contact the um, lead either in your local area or the national kickstart lead. So their employer contacts are there. However, if you do have links with your local chamber or with your um, local enterprise partnership, they would also be a good source of information to go to to just check whether they're offering to be an intermediary in your area. So there's a few ways to do it. There's also um, another route you can potentially go down but obviously it is quite complex which is about trying to get, get networked with some other employers who are able to offer you know sort of some placements as well and you can submit an application on behalf of um, you know a group of employers and you'll get 300 pounds uh, from the government for managing that process but there are requirements for um, organizations who want to take that opportunity or that particular route to it to that and and you have to to have had experience of managing um, 
similar types of partnerships. So that will probably exclude, unfortunately, a lot of people. And we are um, continuing to to push for greater support for 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 sort of SMEs for, for the government to allow them to engage effectively. Because 30 placements, you know, you're going to have to be a big organisation if you're going to be able to actually take on that commitment. Thanks, thanks, Lizzie. Okay, and I think we've got one, well, 30 seconds maybe for um, one final question, and this is to all um, all the panellists before we sign off. Um, and obviously, if people do have more questions, we, we can answer, uh, I, I don't want to stay on for a few minutes, but, um, but we can ask uh, all your them follow up for people. And um, so, it's just one question. So, for all the panellists, what if there was one piece of advice that you would give a young person who was setting out on their, um, either at, at school thinking about their next move or, or or starting on their career, on their job search, what would it be? What would it be? And I'll, and if I go to um, Lucy first. Gosh, that's hard. I say have a plan and pursue it relentlessly. So you can't wait for things to happen to you. You have to work out what it is you want to do and then go for it and keep trying. Don't give up. That's probably four pieces of advice, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Lizzie? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a challenging question, but I think sort of one of the key things for me is that actually you need to be reflecting on on the experiences that you've gained throughout your um, you know education career and through other you know sort of outside activities that you might have done. So you know it's about translating um, some of those things into uh, the language of employers. So ways in which you've worked together, you know, been brownies or scouts as a team to carry out. A type of activity and how that actually you can you can then think about how you can use that information to be reflecting some of the skills that employers are asking for in, in, in their vacancies. Brilliant. Thanks, Susie. And Jane? Do your research. Um, make sure that you've looked at LinkedIn, you've looked on the web, you've researched the business that you're going to interview at um, very thoroughly if you get to interview. Um, and also research businesses that you want to work with that fit the same criteria as you have for yourself and be authentic. Thank you, Jane. Thanks. Uh, I just want to say um, thank you to all our panellists. And I guess the advice I would give is probably resonate with Lizzie's is just don't underestimate, I think for young people, don't underestimate what you, what you already have and what you've already done um, and how that can help you. Okay, so I realize we've been one or two minutes over, but I just want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists. So Lizzie Crowley, Lucy Fast, and Jane Galvez, so thank you very much um, for your time this afternoon. And thank you to everybody um, for joining. There's been some really good um, questions in the chat, um, and we will be providing more uh, follow up and sharing slides and recording next thing. So for those who didn't manage to attend, we'll also share those um, with them too. So um, all that remains to say is thank you very much for coming along. Hope this was helpful and if there are any more questions and um, we can we can follow up with you. So thank you.